You know, this church has been a part of this community for 106 years. Can you turn me up? Can you turn me up a little bit, I guess? Um, the church has been a part of the community for 106 years. We had, in 2013, we had our 100-year anniversary, um, our centennial, I guess you would call that. And, and so this place has been here for a very long time. You know, the, it, it's done a lot of ministry in this area. We, this church has been part of many, many different things from harvest dinners to um, plays and, and, and candlelight services and different things that have gone on. And so it's, it's awesome to see and to look back at the history, um, what this place has done in a place where God's word is so desperately needed. And so I've only been here for six years. In October, it'll be six years. So it's my six-year anniversary as being your pastor here. And I've seen some amazing things that God has done through this body, this body of people. And one thing I have seen, excuse me, <clears throat> one thing I've seen happen so often here um, is that people do a lot of suffering. There is a lot of suffering that goes on here. People go through financial crisis or health crisis or spiritual crisis, you know, losing loved ones or losing jobs. There's a lot of suffering that happens here and so much pain out there in our community. We've taken huge strides to be a place, a, a church, a body of people who seek to meet those kind of needs. You know, we, we, we have our own food pantry and we also go and help Mountain View. We partner with them. Um, in this big food giveaway that we do once a month. And we've helped build Habitat for Humanity homes here in, this, in our community. And we have done what we can do to be the hands and the feet of Christ here in this broken place, in this broken community. And suffering is hard. You know, most of the time when we, when we suffer, we rarely actually see how we're going to get through it in the midst of it. It's hard. When you're in the midst of this pain and 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 the suffering that you're going through, it's hard to see the end of the tunnel, right? Because sometimes it can be so overwhelming. We, we rarely can see how maybe we can move through it and, and, and enter into something that's new and even better. That's hard in the, moment, in the midst of suffering. In fact, often people will ask this question, and I've heard it asked over and over again, and I remember in seminary we actually had a class where we talked about this, um, and I, I actually have changed the way that I look at it now because someone else had shared something with me. But this question is this. Why do bad things happen to good people? You probably have heard that, right? Why do bad things? You probably wondered that. Why do bad things happen to good people? The reality is that statement, as stated, why do, why do bad things happen to good people? That statement has only been true once in history. Only one time. Why do bad things happen to good people? That's only happened once. Luke 18, 18 through 19 says, A certain ruler asked him, meaning Jesus, he asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Now there's a couple things happening in that sentence. First, he's, rec he's kind of getting this ruler to recognize that he is basically calling Jesus. He's, the ruler is basically calling Jesus God because he's saying good teacher. And, he, and Jesus is saying only God is good. So if you're calling me good, then you're recognizing that I am also God. And, um, but also recognizing that no one is good except for God. No one. No one is good. People are always like, you know, I think I've done enough good. Like, I, I've, done, I've been a good person, right? I'll probably get into heaven because I, I've done good things. Well, according to Scripture, that's not what, you're not good. You're not good. You're not, you're not good enough. That's the whole point of Jesus, right, is that we're not good enough, and so he came and died for us because he is the one who was good. So when people ask, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, my response now is that's really only happened once. Are you saying you're a good person? Reality is, scripturally, you're not. You might be good in comparison to someone else, but when you compare to a perfect, holy God, you are not good. You're not good. And that's why there is good news, right? That Jesus came and died for us, that we can actually get past that. That we're not good, but there was one who was. And something bad did happen to them, to him. And because it happened to him, we can now enter into life with 
with Christ and with um, in, in, into heaven with God. When Jesus was was killed on a cross, that was the only something bad that happened to a good person. So someone actually, as I've been wrestling with this com- with this question too, someone told me the real question you should be asking is why do good things happen to bad people? If we're all bad people, yet we experience so much good. I, we really do. I mean, we even during the prayer we talked about how uh, we we can say we can say thank you, God, because for the good things that happen, because all good things come from Him, and so why. Why is God so merciful that he allows good things to happen to bad people? That's really more the question. But I want to read to you Romans 8, 18. It says this, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. I shared with the kids um, that, that, that we, we, we suffer through things all the time. But what's great is that as we... As we place our faith and our our trust in in Christ, we can rest in the assurance that no matter how crazy the suffering is, as it says in Romans 8, it's not even worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed in us, to us, excuse me, that that when, when we get to enter into that position with Christ, all that is going to be like, man, it got me here, really, is what it's going to amount to. That it, it's not even comparable to what we will be able to experience. Now, I share this verse with you because it's actually Trevin's favorite verse, and I want to invite Trevin up here to share a couple of things with you. Oh, the microphone. So I know what everybody's thinking. When are we going to get enough of this kid? But <laughs> I'm here. I'm <laughs> but uh, today's going to be a little different. Nothing's written down. I'm just going to tell you a little story. I'm going to, God's going to speak through me to you. Um, so I'll give you a little background. Um, I grew up here. Well, kind of. I moved away for a little bit to Idaho Falls and um, kind of established down there for a few years. And then we moved back. But uh, I grew up very LDS. And um, and I grew up in Declo for a couple years. And then after I got back from Declo, or after a couple years of Declo, we moved to Burley. And Burley is super LDS, and if you're not LDS, it's awful. So instantly, I I grabbed into the the LDS religion, and uh, hadn't hadn't really realized what I was getting into. Just thought it was the right thing because everybody else was in it. And uh, <laughs> um, it, through Burley, um, my years there, I was there for seven years, and uh, every day at Burley, I was bullied. I was never part of the popular kids. I was never good enough. I was tore down every day. Um, and then I'd go home, and the one person I looked up to the most was probably my brother. And um, But, you know, how brothers are, older brothers, you know, he beat the crap out of me every day just to say he could, you know. Uh, but uh, I got tore down at school, and then I'd go home, and I got tore down all day until my parents came home because he was too scared to do anything then. But uh, I remember one day um, I got a phone call and they said, um, your brother's in jail. He's He got into some bad things. He was doing some drugs he probably shouldn't have been doing. And um, they put him away. And uh, since then, he's been in and out, in and out. Right now, he's he's in, in prison, actually. But uh, so that kind of tore me apart because the one person that I had looked up to my whole life was now this awful person that you know I don't know what's going to happen to him and uh, I remember what it was a couple weeks after that my dad comes to me and he says "Um, would you mind and you know I'm going through school and the LDS religion and um, I was just lost I didn't know I didn't feel like I had any purpose on in life my dad comes to me one day and he says hey would you mind watching the house for us for a couple days we're going to go on a trip I think I don't even remember what it's for but um, and I said, yeah, you know, I, I'm fine sitting at the house, you know, and I remember the first night I was there, it was three nights. I remember the first night I was there it was Thursday and, uh, I'd done my normal thing, you know, played, played a few video games, watched some TV, ate some food, a lot of food. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but I, there was always this thought in my mind, like, 
what am I doing? Why, why am I here? Like I'm purposeless, you know, and I tore myself down exactly how everybody else had done it. And this whole year before that, I had failed school I'd, on purpose. I didn't care anymore. I just, I wanted out of the situation I was in, but nobody listened to me. My parents were, would tell me we're not, you're not going to the school you want to go to. And, and, uh, this is where you are. I don't care if you're being bullied or that's the way I took it is they were, they, that's all they would tell me is I don't care if you're getting bullied. If the teachers aren't going to don't like you, I don't care. We're just going to leave you in this situation. And, uh, um, I remember the next day was, uh, Friday. It was another normal day, but it, the thoughts got worse and worse. And then the next day was Saturday. And, uh, uh, it was so bad. That was the only thing I did that day. I didn't turn on the TV. I didn't, I didn't play my Xbox. I didn't do anything. That was just my thoughts all day was, you're not good enough. You don't deserve to be here. You have no purpose in life. So then Sunday morning came, it's about nine o'clock. I didn't sleep at all the night before and, um, uh, found some rope and I hung it up and I was ready to call it. I was ready to just to take it all, you know, erase myself from everything. And, uh, I remember right after I got it all tied up, I was ready to do it. The phone rang and uh, it was my mom. She says, hey, we found this new church that we really want to go to. Um, do you want to come with us? You know, we've been a couple of times and feel like, like it might be something good for you. And uh, I said, you know what? I could put off what I had planned for today for a little bit and just try something new out. And I remember I walked in and... Uh, the, and in the morning we did a little bit of a, a birthday thing for for Ella because it was her birthday, uh, Vance and Alicia's daughter. And uh, I remember I went down and I met Jared, and uh, I thought he was a little weird. He comes up to me and you know he's out there and I'm kind of in my shell, you know, kind of still going through everything. And uh, and uh, he he comes up, introduces himself. He's a nice person ever, you know. I think every single person that was at church that day introduced themselves to me. And uh, I remember the sermon. I, I can't tell you what the sermon was about just because there were so many things going on in my mind as the sermon went through. But uh, I remember after the service, I had I was just changed. We we stayed for a little bit. It kind of shook everybody's hand, got to know everybody. And then they took me back to my dad's house. And I remember I just I was like, I this church, I needed to be part of it. I felt like there was something calling me to be here. And so I threw away the rope and I, you know, I was like, if it's not where I'm meant to be, maybe that's what I meant to do. So I didn't throw it away. I kept it, you know, and, uh, and, uh, a couple of months later going into the church and everything, I think we had went pretty good, pretty much every, every sat Sunday. And, um, I remember Jared, <laughs> Jared was, um, uh, come up to me one day and he's like, Hey, do you want to go to this, uh, this regional thing with me that's it was kind of weird. It was just kind of like a questionnaire type deal. We went and they asked people asked a bunch of questions. There were like little forums and stuff you could join. And uh, one of the ladies comes up to me and she's like, "Hey, do you want to go to camp with us this year? You know, you seem like a good youth. You could, you're welcome to come to camp." And uh, camp has always been super big for me. You know, I, even growing up LDS, I went to camps and stuff, and that was like the highlight of my years. And uh, I said, "Yeah." I'm, I'm, I'm down to go camping. Let's go. And, uh, so we signed all the paperwork, did everything. And I remember I got up there and I, and, uh, you know, it was my first year. Everybody else had been there for a few years. So I showed up and, um, there was a couple kids that, you know, just instantly come up to me and we're like, Hey, uh, first one's name was Caden. He walked up to me. He's like, hi, I'm Caden. It's really nice to meet you. What's your name? I told him. And, um, another one's name was Warren. And, uh, growing up, I was huge into football. Football was always my favorite thing. Um, still is, but, um, I got, got into all that and, uh, Warren's this big kid and he's, he's the ideal football player. So instantly I, I grabbed onto him and that's, that's who my friend was going to be because, because he was awesome. He was the football player. And, um, I didn't even, didn't ever think about this Caden kid. This, this Caden kid didn't really didn't really interest me. We didn't really have the same interests or anything. And, um, so I didn't grab onto him the next year I went, I remember, sorry, I'll backtrack a little bit. I remember the day that I came back from camp, I threw away my rope 
I didn't need it anymore because I was changed. I knew that I had purpose in life and that was to do whatever I could to, to be part of this and to, to let God have his way with me and let me do, let him do whatever he needed to do with me. Um, and I remember uh, growing up LDS, missions were a huge thing. Um, you always wanted to go on a mission. You needed to go on a mission. Um, and so that's what I was taught. I was taught you have to go on a mission. So when I switched, I, I thought to myself at camp and it just kind of dawned on me. I was like, what about a mission? You know, I was supposed to go on a mission. What am I going to do now? So I walked up to Jared in camp and um, I said, Jared, growing up LDS, the mission was like the most important thing to me. What am I going to do now? What, what, what can I do in like a mission type sense to, to be better in this church? And he said, well, I'm going to Africa in September. You want to go? <laughs> and uh, most of you know the story. Um, we went, you know, did everything, worked. God worked through us. We we trained church pastors and we took f clothes to people and, you know, all that all that fun stuff. But I remember at camp that year, um, and I'm still shy. You know, I'm not really out there um, with the with the counselors, at least with the campers. I had I think I had two girls around my arms. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm just walking around. Um, and it was during our service thing and, uh, we, we were walking, cleaning up garbage or something. And we're just walking down the streets and we see this guy with his hood up and, and, uh, he goes, um, and so we stopped, talked to him, figure out what's wrong with the car. Well, he just needed his, his AC needed to recharge. It wasn't bad, but, uh, we walk up to him and, and, uh, we say, well, it was really nice to meet you. Would you mind if we prayed for you, you know, just for safe travels? Cause he was going somewhere and. Um, and he said, yeah, that'd be fine. And so instantly they called Jared. Jared's the church pastor. So they're like, Jared, get up here. You're the church pastor. And, uh, the guy says, no, I don't want him. He does it all the time. I want one of the campers to do it. And of course, you know, we're all 12, 13 year old kids. So none of us are going to do it. None of us are going to step up. And, uh, after a couple seconds of silence, you know, waiting for somebody to do it, I finally said, you know what? I'll do it. So I did it. And uh, I felt like that was the first time that God actually spoke through me to somebody and like helped me to, to like come out of my shell and break apart from everything. Um, so then the next year at camp, uh, Warren doesn't go. I was Warren was supposed to be my camp best friend. We were supposed to play football together, do all this stuff. Um, he doesn't go. He has football camp, baseball camp, whatever. And, um, uh, I get to know this kid, Caden, and Caden's going through a hard time. He's never met his dad before. Um, his mom's in jail. He's living with his aunt. His aunt lives in a double-wide trailer with a bunch of people because she has kids, and then she has to take in all his brothers and sisters, and it's just a big mess. And um, he opened up to me and told me everything that was going on. I had told him about my experience within the last you know couple years, and uh, and me and Caden have grown so good actually that, uh, right now I'm, we're working on getting an apartment together in Boise and, and, uh, kind of, you know, being roommates and going to school together and all that type of stuff. And, um, uh, but you know, just, and we've done food giveaways. I've went to a lot of them. And then, um, leading up to this, this last year, my senior year of high school, my last year to go to camp, everything's the last for me. Um, you do senior projects and stuff like that. And, uh, most of you guys were here for that, but, um, we did, I, the whole time I'm stressing out, trying to figure out what I'm going to do. You know, I don't know what, what's going to happen after I got to apply for college. I got to do all this stuff. And then, um, the senior project I wanted to do got turned down. And so I said, well, you know, that was going to cost me a lot of money. We were prepared to do that. What are we going to do now? And, uh, I remember, I, I asked Jared about it and he's like, well, I don't really know. I don't really have any plans. And he talked about doing renovations, you know, to the church. And so I was like, well, um, we could do, what if we did like a renovation? And then I was like, that doesn't really, that's not something I want to do. I don't want to do renovations my whole life. I was like, I want to do something for my senior project that, that I'd want to do for my whole life. And I'd want to, that would make an impact, you know? And so I said, what if I was to do your job? If I was to take over like for a week, I think it was, we had to have 10 hours of work. I said, what if I took over your job? So I did exactly that. We went to the food giveaway. That was one of them. We did 
we retextured the walls out there and did some stuff. Um, and then I did a sermon and um, that was huge for me. I had a lot of people come up to me after and, you know, I had invited a bunch of people here. So there was a lot of people here that day. And uh, I had invited a bunch of people to, to show up and a bunch of people after were like, a lot of them were LDS and a lot of them started thinking, you know, what if that's not where I'm supposed to be, you know? And so then they started thinking and I'm still kind of working on them a little bit because they're still stubborn as always. But uh, anyways, the whole, the whole purpose of this was just to, to show that, that we've made a difference here. We've done, <laughs> we, we've done great things. We've changed people's lives. We've, We've done little, we've done great little things like, you know, help out at the food giveaway, you know, get Syringa. We, you know, we're a partner in Syringa. We've done amazing things through this church and we can, we can continue to do that. But that was the whole purpose of this whole thing was just to show the impact of this church. Amen. Yeah, well, and I wanted Trevin to share his kind of your testimony really is what this is and because I it's moving to me I'm sitting up here trying not to cry while he's sharing it um, but being able to see it's not even like one person who impacted him completely but it was this community of people here that somehow God used to, to kind of grab him out of where he was at and to bring him where he is now and I know he doesn't I, you didn't really share this part, but he's been sort of talking to me about maybe doing seminary kind of stuff. I don't know. Um, ministry is kind of an interest of his in a way. It may not look like what I'm doing, but it, it'll it'll look like something. God's got him to some extent here, and so he's going to have to deal with that the rest of his life, I think. But um, but it's great to to hear your story and and where you've come from and where you've struggled and and come through, and so. It's meant to be sort of an inspiration for you guys and also just to help help all of us recognize um, the impact that um, this church is having um, in the community around us. So 